Welcome everyone, my name is Sawyer Balak and I'm a fellow at Cleveland Clinic and I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Fadi Haddad today from uh, MD Anderson and we're here at ASH 2025 and we're having a discussion on CML. Uh, the first thing we'd like to talk about is the ASC4 FIRST study uh, looking at a simnent uh, in frontline setting and gets uh, investigator uh, selected TKIs. Um, Dr. Haddad, when you're evaluating uh, patients for upfront TKIs, what sort of things do you look at and kind of uh, analyze before to kind of decide what the optimal therapy is for that patient? Dr. Bowick, thank you so much for the introduction. That's a great overview. We're all so excited at ASH, a lot of CML updates this year. And particularly, as you mentioned, the ask for first trial, which is the trial that evaluated asimenib in patients with newly diagnosed chronic myeloid leukemia, randomized to either asimenib or investigator choice of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor TKI. In this study, investigators show superiority of asimenib compared to either imatinib or second-generation TKIs in terms of molecular remissions, deep molecular responses, as well as a better safety profile. Yeah. Now, to go back to your question, how to decide on the best or optimal treatment yeah. for my patient in a clinic who has newly diagnosed CML, basically, we need to look at a few factors. I would say, number one is the goal of treatment. Yeah. It's very important when we meet with our patients in the clinic to discuss with them what is their goal of therapy. Is their goal of therapy to stop treatment earlier? Maybe young patient, patient that wanna get pregnant, patient not willing to take lifelong treatment. In this case, I wanna go for a newer drug, for a stronger drug. Asimenib, for example, add, as we've shown, and ask for first leading to higher molecular response rates. So by using potent drugs in the frontline setting, patients can potentially achieve a deep molecular remission faster and possibly discontinue treatment and have higher rates of what we call treatment-free remission. Now, for patients who potentially are not interested in stopping therapy, maybe patients uh, wish to continue treatment lifelong, they feel safer, and their goal is just to normalize survival. In those cases, any TKI basically offers a, a similar survival, which is near what the normal population expects in these days. And also, it's very important when we select our patients to look at their comorbidities. Do they have pulmonary disease? Do they have cardiovascular disease? And patients with cardiovascular disease, maybe imatinib, you know, the oldest TKI is very safe on the heart. Busutinib is safe as well. And patients who have potentially uh, lung disease, COPD, heavy smokers, I would not favor the satinib. So it's good to balance the patient characteristics with the goal of therapy when selecting the proper TKI for your patient in clinic. Mm -hmm. I know one kind of conversation we had a little bit earlier is uh, panatinib and the toxicities associated with that. Uh, when it analyzing patients that you think would be kind of optimal candidates for panatinib and, and the management of toxicities, what sort of approach do you have and also with kind of like the doses adjustments that you make? Very good question, Dr. Bawak. I'm glad you brought the ponatinib issue because I believe ponatinib is a really a very potent drug. NCML shown uh, efficacy in patients with multiply relapsed refractory, really a heavily pretreated patient population. But as you nicely mentioned, we have very high concerns of cardiovascular toxicities. Yeah. But we had for the past five years data from the OPTIC trial, which was recently also updated uh, a month ago, and we have uh, further updates on that. In the OPTIC trial, investigators look at what we call ponatinib dose optimization, in which we start patients on ponatinib at a higher dose, 45 milligram or 30 milligram per day, and then we decrease it to 15 milligram per day once the patient achieved a complete cytogenetic response or a PCR level below 1%. Yeah. And by doing the strategy, we are able to maintain efficacy why reducing the risk of side effects. So I would say for your patients in the clinic who have multiple left refractory disease, not a lot of treatment options, ponatinib is a good choice, two strategies. If the patient, uh, or I would say start the patient at 30 to 45 milligram per day, reduce it to 15 milligram once the patient is in a complete cytogenetic response. And now another uh, strategy that I use personally in the clinic, I know some investigators do use that as well. It's not adopted nationwide, but I think it's highly recommended is to use prophylaxis 
with baby aspirin, low dose aspirin, and statin, adorvastatin, rosuvastatin, etc., to kind of help patients prevent cardiovascular toxicity associated with ponatinic. Okay. Awesome. Um, another thing too, uh, Ash, uh, kind of a big topic this year is uh, ASXL1. Uh, uh, these individuals uh, do not tend to do as well. Um, so as far as your approach um, and kind of the updates that you've seen here at um, ASH here, yeah. um, as far as going forward, individuals that have ASXL1, how are you going to kind of manage those patients or what sort of things are you kind of going to consider uh, when choosing the optimal therapy? Very good question. Recently, over the past two, three years, we've been talking more and more about the impact of what we call additional genomic or genetic abnormalities which are the myeloid mutations such as ASXL1, RONX1, et cetera, and what is their impact on chronic myeloid leukemia patients. So in this, in this ASH, uh, there have been a report also that looked at patients treated and the ask for first a trial of a seminal versus investigator choice CKI in frontline CML, where they looked at those mutations. And on average, I would say 20% of the patients with newly diagnosed CML would harbor some of these mutations most frequently is ASXL1 and about 8 to 10% of the patients at the time of diagnosis. And this is separate from the ABL1 kinase mutation. Those are myeloid type of mutations that we see. Yeah. And we have shown that, not myself, but other investigators have shown that the presence of these mutations is associated with lower molecular response rates, a higher rate of treatment failure, and a high rate of acquisition of ABL1 kinase domain mutations. And in the subgroup, in the subset of patients treated and asked for first trial, those who had ASXL1 mutations had worse outcomes, whether treated with asiminib or with investigator TKI. When we compared them to patients who did not have the ASXL1 mutations, there was a clear benefit for asiminib compared to the other drugs. So I would say in the absence of ASXL1, Asiminib did better than the other drugs. However, when ASXL1 mutation prognosis was similar, but it was lower than what we would expect in the absence of this mutation. Awesome. Thank you for that. And, and you know, kind of as we wrap up our CML kind of discussion here and looking at ASH and kind of a wrap up here, are there any other studies that you would like to highlight or any things that you're super excited about that you're going to take home and try to implement in the clinic or things that you'd like to look, see going forward um, in CML research? Very interesting, Dr. Balak. I think this year there have been a really lot of abstract, very exciting data presented at ASH 2025. If I want to pick one abstract, maybe I would talk about second line treatment in patients who fail frontline treatment with a second generation TKI, very particular subject not previously reported upon, uh, from our group, we looked at 276 patients who received either dasatinib, nilotinib, bosutinib in the frontline setting, failed the treatment, mostly for side effects, but some of them for disease resistance, and went on to receive second-line treatment with any of the available TKIs. So we looked at their outcomes, and we saw that patients who had true disease resistance, 60 to 70% of them were able to achieve a complete cytogenetic response or deeper after switching to a second line treatment. Okay. Now, when we looked at the type of second line treatment, patients who received the newer drugs, such as ponatinib or asiminib, did actually better. And they had an MMR rate of about 77% compared to about 30% when they switched to an alternate second generation TKI. So maybe one key important message from this study, which is similar to what we see in third line setting, if you have a patient who failed frontline treatment with a second generation TKI, it's better to use a newer drug in the second line setting, such as ponatinib, asiminib, rather than switching to an alternate second generation TKI. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for that explanation and highlighting that uh, abstract. And um, thank you for, very well for sitting with us here today. Dr. Bowick, thank you so much. That was an excellent wrap up of ASH 2025. I wish you and everybody a good rest of the meeting and uh, looking forward to more updates at Ash 2026. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.